How are you, James? Pleasure to meet you. Oh, nice to meet you too. Thank you. You know, so I've been just uh, creeping out some of your your interviews on YouTube, and I've, I've noticed immediately that you're a huge cinephile. And right off the right off the jump, as a child, is your is your direct love for movies and personal filmmaking, you know, as watching these kind of movies. I think you mentioned uh, *Spare the Beehive* and all the all that stuff. Is this personal approach a direct uh, influence on why you wanted to become a filmmaker and your aesthetic to this, even to this day, as a filmmaker as well? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so I think my love, I mean, I, I grew up in movie theaters. Um, I mean, they felt like churches to, to me. Um, you know, I mean, my early, very early memories um, are of going to the movies um, with my parents. And then my parents were big cinephiles and sort of um, had films that they would um, sort of that we would watch together. Um, and then later I'd work in a movie. I worked in a movie theater. And I mean, and sort of parallel with that was um my my mother wrote short stories and my grandfather was an artist and um how he made his living was by painting book covers for people like agatha christie and shirley jackson and he would also paint movie posters um um something that i didn't realize at the time it wasn't until later that i found um posters that he had done of a lot of like american films um he would do the posters when they would go overseas and play in say france like i have a french version of the deliverance poster and there's sort of Papillon escape from Alcatraz and things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just, people who are creating things and telling stories were around me. And, um, so yes, it was in, in my blood, I guess, from early on. You know, I, I, I really love summering and I, I, I want to be transparent. It's getting some different reviews. Some people really take it hard like me and some people have different takes on it. And I, I have a feeling this is a movie that to me is very layered and it, it requires multiple viewings. Can you just talk about your creative choice in making, you could have made, you're talented enough to make a commercially driven coming of age story about girls, but you, young girls, but you wanted to do something just more transcendent. Um, was that an easy choice as far as not pandering to a populist view on, on, a, on a narrative, I guess? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, um, I think as audience members, um, you know, I think we need to experience multiple subjectivities, you know, um, to understand the way structural violence um, sort of is transmitted through society, which is a very heady way of talking about what the film is about. You know, um, it's it's about four friends. Um, they're at that specific moment, sort of pre-adolescence, um, when, you know, kids exist emotionally, um, you know, on, on a and mentally on a, on a spectrum as far as the personal development. But I think some kids at that age, um, you know, still can present as quite innocent, use their imaginations to process trauma. Some kids are world weary and cynical already at that age, you know, and they, and then very soon there'll be teenagers who are sprinting towards adulthood. But this is very specifically set at a, at a moment in time um, when that shift hasn't quite yet happened. And it's, and it's also um, a story that, you know, is a, you know, um, I think informed by myself being a parent. Um, I have three kids and so much of the film, it is subjective to the um, young protagonist experience, but it is also about their conversation and about the conversations that happen between generations because their parents are characters as well. And there is that, I think that disconnect of parents wanting to understand their kids, wanting to give their kids the freedom of childhood. But of course we inevitably project our own um, anxieties and neuroses onto our own kids. Um, so all of that sort of were things that sort of informed um, the, the story. And then just lots and lots and lots and lots of conversations with all the people in, in my life. My wife works at a middle school, high school. So it's like every year there's a new group of 11 and 12 year olds. My co-writer, Ben Percy and I, I've been working together. We started working together a long time ago um, when I adapted a short story of his about young men and violence. Um, like this was over 15 years ago, um, a story called Refresh, Refresh that was turned into a graphic novel. Um, and he has children and children the age of these characters. So it's really just a part of our lives. And and that, that sort of um, back and forth that I kind of alluded to of kids presenting as innocent at times and sometimes being so wildly, gut-wrenchingly, um, not innocent and just um, cynical and um, informed by how traumatic the world can be. Um, and and parents, you know, um, having to look their kids in the eye, especially, you know, what it's been in the past couple of years where, you know, in my case, I have young kids who are afraid for me and my wife to leave the house because um, they thought that if we 
breathe bad air, we might die, which sounds like the stuff of science fiction, but that is the weird reality that we all find ourselves in now. You, you mentioned uh, in one of your interviews, your love for uh, Yasujiro Ozu. And a lot of people say he's a, Ozu is a very, um, very subtle filmmaker, but I just rewatched Late Spring, one of my all-time favorite films, and he uses a lot of score and music to, to his stuff. Yeah. And I just want you to, uh, wondering for, for some reason, what was the, the balance as far as using, I really loved how you used your score, but what is that creative balance for you to, to make sure it's not overdone, but it's also a character in the story? What kind of um, decisions go, in, go inside your brain regarding that? Yeah. Um... Um, and I'll also just say, as a yes, as a huge Ozu fan, I mean, it's interesting also in so many of his films, like if you rewatch Good Morning, it's interesting just with the sound design of just the sound of farts, of boys being obsessed with the sound of farts is part of <laughs> what informs the, the audio experience of that of that film. And of course, like young people and technology actually is sort of um, in a gentle way part of his stories. Um, but yeah, with Summering, um, you know, one of my really big collaborations, one of my biggest is with um, Sophie, Sophia Hulquist, who records as Drum and Lace. Um, she's a remarkable um, composer. And it was important for me, you know, for whether it was with the cinematography and my collaboration with Greta Zazula and the way that we were filming um, our actors or the way that the score worked in the film, that it sounds subjective to the experience of these, um, of these young people, you know, that it feel like that it was the sound of their emotional inner life, lives and their psyche, which inevitably would be informed by music that they were listening to on Spotify um, or on YouTube, um, which is to say, I knew early on that I wanted score that was electronic and maybe somewhat ele experimental electronic married with the human voice, like with female choral, um, with a female choral component. Um, and that's very general, but I, that was something that felt appropriate. And when I was introduced to Sophie, uh, and I was just a huge fan of, of work that she'd done and um, specifically on a show called Dickinson. And, um, and she's an amazing sort of musician in her own right, aside from the score that she does. She just immediately, um, instead of just us spotting the film, a lot of the conversations were her talking about her own childhood when she was um, these girls age and about her relationship to her child now as a mother. And so many of the themes in the story that um, were already internal to her and just um, felt like we very much had a similar view of how to how to externalize the emotional inner lives of the protagonists. I'm going to read a couple of lines here. It says here, um, passed down like folk songs, our love lasts so long. <laughs> so a couple, couple of questions, your employment of that Taylor Swift track, Seven, and how it relates to your narrative. And I think ultimately is the most important part regarding even if you're 12, that stays in your psyche, even at our age these days, the most important part, whether or not they're your friends today or the next summer, it's the love and the support that you have for that summer that maybe solidifies so much yourself throughout those years. So those oh, two questions. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, at, at that age, at 11 or 12, um, you know, your friendships, especially I think um, female friendships, can be articulated the value of a friendship the value of your friends is something that that these characters are able to talk about it probably with better articulation than young boys can <laughs> um who might talk about sports or music or movies or that third thing um but that fear of losing your best friend at that age can is so front of mind and in some cases it may be more front of mind than death um which can feel abstract not necessarily it depends on a personal experience but can be very real it can feel like a death and you know the change of going to a new school, of not having your friend around you, can feel like like a type of death. And yeah, the Taylor Swift song. I mean, I I listen to it a lot um, during with my with my family, with my children um, during during the first year of quarantine. I mean, continued to. And that song um, I find so moving and beautiful and haunting, and it feels. It is a folk song um, that feels, um, you know, it's a story about childhood, but it's about a memory of childhood and maybe a dream of childhood and maybe a nightmare of childhood, which is sort of a way that I wanted this film to to feel. And it is about the relationships that you develop at that age that it just get deep in your bones, in your blood and stay with you for the rest of your life. Um, and even, even as perhaps your perception of what that relationship was and what that person you were 
in a relationship with, in a friendship with might change when you get older and realize that you were having very, very different experiences perhaps in your home life. A couple more questions is, uh, I think it was, I, f- I forgot, it might have been my back pages where I think Dylan says, um, I was so much older than, I'm younger than that now. Mm-hmm. So regarding your film summary, did you ever wonder why you're cre- crafting this movie where maybe not you personally, but I'm watching your movie and I'm thinking, where did I lose all my sense of imagination? Most important, import, importantly, guts, <laughs> you know, and um, that's, I think, another thing that works through. And I think a lot of the parents, the mothers, they, they're wondering about that as well. Is that one of the themes of, of summering? And I, th- I think it's really wonderful how you approached it, too. So. Thank you. I mean, I, I think it is a, like a beautiful thing about childhood is that we when we're kids, we all have the ability to use imagination as a tool to do anything, but certainly to process trauma, whether it's, you know, personal, structural, you know, whatever it is, a a parent's marriage falling apart, the death of a loved one, things like that. Imagination becomes a way way that we can make sense of things and make make order out of things that feel totally randomized and and disorderly. And I think um, as we get older, yeah, many, many people hold on to that, to that imagination. A lot of us lose it. Um, I think a lot of people, a lot of people's, a lot of the artists that I admire, I think their brilliance is that they can tap into the imagination of childhood. Like it's exact, that's exactly the thing that they have. Um, So I I think that, that is um, that specific moment when it is still a ready tool, um, imagination, but maybe lost soon because we all know what (laughs) seventh and eighth grade are like when you get to middle school, it becomes, um, it can feel like a horror film, you know, a horror film of personal traumas, you know, of, of losing the people that you love and, and the world feeling like it's turned upside down on you. And before I let you go, very quick, quick, uh, quick double question. Uh, are you still working? What are you working on right now? Are you still doing um, Wild City? And the second part of it is very quickly right off the top of your head. Can you name one of your all time favorite films? I know for you, it's very hard. And what is it about this specific film that that resonates with you? And that's it. I'm going to shut up. So. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, what I'm working on right now, um, I am finishing a new television series actually for um, for Apple. It's called Shrinking um, and it is about therapists, <laughs> about psychiatrists. Um, and it's with uh, um, Harrison Ford and Jessica Williams and Jason Siegel and a really great cast. Um, it's from the folks that made Ted Lasso. Um, it's going to be a great show. Um, and I've really loved working on it. And favorite films. There's so many I'm just mentally. Um, so, yeah. K- Killer of Sheep by Charles Burnett um, is one that um, I saw in college. I was later fortunate enough to be able to interview Charles when Milestone um, re-released it, I think in 2006, and which was like very much for me, like, like the end of that movie, that Kurosami movie close up, it was like meeting a personal God, just like, oh my God. Um, but that's a movie that um, about families, about parents and children, that's always it always has a deep ability to just um, bring me to my knees and to move me and um, inspire me and make me feel hope and love. I just wonder why Burnett didn't get like that big, huge Hollywood deal, or is that a, a wrong-headed way to think about it? Because his career is so such a landmark career. I mean, Killer of Sheep is amazing, but is it just because it's, I, I don't know. I don't know how to even form that into a question, but he's amazing. What was it like interviewing him? Was it amazing? R- remarkable. And, you know, he made many other, Great films. To Sleep with Anger is probably the most, with Danny Glover, probably the most well-known other film of his. Um, you know, I, I think, I think you know, like Ozu, um, you know, I, I think, uh, like I th- Ozu and Charles Burnett are two filmmakers that I think of as being very kindred, as people that are interested in family dynamics and the, um, you know, and, and, and nuanced portraits of um, structural issues related to class and race and gender um, and all, all of those things that don't fit easy compartmental, compartmentalization that are not easily marketable <laughs> um, um, because they are as complicated as families and people are. Um, it's why his films are so rich um, and why they, I believe, will endure, um, you know, long past any of us are, are on this earth. Um, I think people will still be watching his films. James, thank you so much for your time. I really love summering and, and uh, looking forward to interviewing you again and talk more Ozu stuff. So, Oh, I look forward to it. Thank you so much.